This is the Big 550 KTRS and KPLR-TV, Channel 11.2. I am Paul Harris filling in on the McGraw Show. He is still away, coming home in a couple of days from the Super Bowl. While he's gone, I get to play. And speaking of the Super Bowl, later on in this hour, we'll check on how well you remember the Super Bowl commercials. My annual Super Bowl ad quiz coming up along with Knuckleheads in the News later on this hour here on the Big 550 KTRS. But to start things off this hour, let me introduce you to Dr. Peter Langman, who is a psychologist who has written a very interesting new book about school shooters. The subtitle of it is Understanding High School, College, and Adult Perpetrators. Dr. Langman, welcome to the Big 550 KTRS. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Peter is joining me live via Skype this morning, so our viewers on TV or on our video stream on KTRS.com can see as well as hear him as we go through this. Um, I remember being on this radio station back in 1999 when we had the horrible attack of April 20th at Columbine High School just outside of Denver, Colorado, which shook the country to its core and really reminded us of how vulnerable our children are when they go to school. Since then, we've had multiple incidents. One of the more recent famous ones would be the Adam Lanza attack at Sandy Hook. You've written this book where you've looked at the psychology of the people involved in this. Have you found a pattern? Yes, what you tend to see among the perpetrators is that they fall into one of three general categories. And the first is the psychopathic personality, someone like Eric Harris with no conscience and extreme narcissism. The second category is the psychotic shooter, someone like Sung Hui Cho at Virginia Tech who's suffering from schizophrenia, has delusions, maybe hallucinations. And the third type is the traumatized shooter. And these are kids from extremely dysfunctional backgrounds, violent homes, uh, suffered physical abuse, and sometimes sexual abuse as well. It's interesting that you mentioned those three different categories, but you think it, because I think if you ask the average American to give you a quick profile of a school shooter, based on media reports that we think we have heard through the years, we would have said, oh, these are mostly kids who've been bullied at school. That's not the case? In my, my research, it's really not the case. Some of them certainly have been bullied. You know, when you talk about middle school and high school, a very high number of kids have been picked on to some extent. But that does not seem to be the driving factor in these people's attacks. Out of the 48 shooters covered in my book, only one of them actually specifically targeted a kid who had picked on him. So they're not going after the tormentors? Correct. So what is it that they're trying to achieve if they're not trying to get back at the people who did them wrong? Well, in some cases they are seeking revenge, but it's not against the kids who picked on them. The most common targets were teachers and administrators. So they're going after people who may have suspended them or expelled them, or teachers who failed them in a class or for an entire grade. And the second most common targets were girls. These are girls either went out with them and then broke up or never uh, would go out with them at all. So there is often an element of retaliation, but it's not against bullies. Have you had a chance, in addition to doing the research for your book, to actually sit down and evaluate face-to-face -face someone who was a, a school shooter or, or who had committed violence on a campus? I have not interviewed any of the actual school shooters, but I got into this topic back in 99 in the wake of the Columbine attack because I was at a psychiatric hospital for children and adolescents, and 10 days after Columbine, a 16-year-old boy was admitted because he was seen as a school shooter risk and for 12 years there I was working with potential school shooters on a somewhat regular basis. So what did you see that we could use to prevent school shootings? Did, I mean when you talk about uh, the, the patterns here and the different uh, uh, personality types, uh, is there something that you could identify that would say after you've talked to somebody for a little while, okay this is a kid we've got to keep an eye on or got to do something about? When you're looking for warning signs, it really comes down to what's called attack-related behavior. Have they said or done anything that indicates they are planning to commit an act of violence? So it's not simply that they might be narcissistic or angry or have been recently rejected by a girl. You're looking for evidence that they might be stockpiling weapons, 
talking to friends about what they're planning to do, maybe trying to recruit a friend or maybe trying to warn their friends to stay away from school so they don't get hurt. You're really looking for attack-related behavior. Yeah, and how much of that responsibility do we lay at the feet of the parents? Because I remember in the Columbine case, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, these are kids who are building pipe bombs in their basement and mom and dad never knew it. Well, actually, in the case of Eric Harris, on at least one occasion, his parents did find a bomb that he had made, and they simply told him to stop doing it, and he said, okay, but he went right on doing it, and he just did a better job of not getting caught. Mm -hmm. So, in some cases, parents have seen warning signs, but they never knew what their children were actually planning to do. But that's got to be our first line of defense, right? Parents doing a better job paying attention to maybe their children aren't necessarily building bombs, but what their parent, what their children might be thinking about doing or talking about doing, they've got to confront that on the home front, don't they? Well, I certainly think parents need to be educated. They need to know what to look for and what to do when they see it. But I think maybe even more important is teaching the kids at school what to look for and what to do, because they're the ones historically who have had the most information about what their peers were planning to do. So I think maybe the number one line of defense is really reaching to the students to educate them. Do the, most of the shooters talk about their plans? Most of the shooters give some indication, especially the younger ones, the middle school and, and high school students, they tend to do a, a lot of what is called leakage. They leak their intentions. As I said, in some cases to try to recruit someone to join them, in other cases to warn someone away. Sometimes it's just plain bragging. They talk about they're going to be on the news, they're going to do something big. So the younger shooters tend to leave a long trail of leakage. So if their peers are trained to recognize it, they are in a position to notify adults and allow someone to investigate. And have we had instances where kids in school did come forward and say, hey, you know what, Jimmy's been talking about some sick stuff here, and they go to an administrator or somebody else and, they, and something is actually done about it? And what, well, then what is done? Well, that's a good question. There have been many cases where that has occurred. People tend not to hear about them because if there is no shooting, it's basically a non-event. Right. But sometimes the plans were significant enough that it has made the news. And most foiled attacks have been stopped because it was students who recognized the danger and came forward. And that could lead to a couple of different things. It might be, you know, a conversation between someone at school and the student. It may turn out to be a false alarm. It may lead to law enforcement involvement if the student has illegal weapons or explosives. It may lead to, you know, mental health uh, placement in a hospital or a residential program. So the outcome really depends on the nature of the incident. Do we also have a problem with a certain percentage of people who just don't want to believe that about somebody they may have perceived as a good kid? Oh, he would never do that. Yeah, there often is a level of denial, either among the kids who know the potential perpetrator, the, the parents, the, the teachers or administrators. They may know the family. They may think it's simply not possible that he may be angry, he may be saying things, but he doesn't really mean it. So overcoming people's denial or you know, inability to, to believe that someone could be a killer is really important. What's the psychology of a community that has gone through something like this? I'm thinking about Columbine. I'm thinking about Norwalk, Connecticut. I'm thinking about many of the other places where we've seen this. Virginia Tech, I know, uh, took quite a while for that campus to heal afterwards. Is it possible for people to ever go back to what you would call any kind of a semblance of a normal life in the short time span they're going to spend on that campus? I think a school shooting just devastates not only the school, but the entire community, the whole town that it occurs in. And it can take years for that community to really come together. And there often are divisions. Um, there can be a lot of animosity, obviously, between the, uh, the victims and the family of the perpetrator. Um, there are often lawsuits. So, 
you know, communities are really torn apart by an act uh, of this magnitude. And when we do have an incident like this, sometimes we have a bunch of other incidents that follow it rather quickly in the news cycle. I don't know if that's because our, our, our news departments have become more aware of it once something has happened. And, and so we're looking for it more on our Google News alerts and that sort of thing. Or are we running into continuing problems with copycats? In some cases, there is evidence that one shooter does copy a previous shooter. So um, they look to Eric Harris as a role model and they follow in his footsteps. Um, We can often trace the impact of one incident on a subsequent incident. And does the pattern from that first incident then follow with the others? They may change the method, but they may draw, in a sense, you know, inspiration or try to learn from what a previous shooter did. So one shooter certainly looks to previous shooters in many cases. Have we gotten better at dealing with this in both preventing it and handling the aftermath since Columbine? I definitely think schools are moving in the right direction despite the publicity associated with a magnet, an event like uh, the magnitude of Sandy Hook. Overall, schools are safer now than 20 years ago, though that's not the common perception. Schools are doing much more to make themselves safer places. The book is called School Shooters, Understanding High School, College, and Adult Perpetrators, written by psychologist Dr. Peter Langman. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Thank you. I'm Paul Harris. This is the Big 550 KTRS. This is McGraw Live on KPLR 11.2, stltoday.com, and the Big 550 KTRS.